Hello, this is Joseph Zotel. Today's topic is the Second Amendment. I've run into people who have told me that the Second Amendment gives them the right to carry a gun anywhere they want, anytime they want, including even an automatic rifle, and that it forbids gun control. I ask them, have you read the Second Amendment? And they often say, no, but I know what it says. I think if we want to know what it says, step one is to read the Second Amendment, which doesn't mention guns, automatic rifles, or gun control. There's a copy of the Constitution down below, which you can download and save for future reference. Please do that now and go to the Second Amendment. The document is bookmarked, so it's easy to find. Also down below, you'll find a link to a list of my books at Amazon, including free previews. I hope you find something there you like. Otherwise, you can use the next link to buy me a coffee. So the Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Nothing about gun control, nothing about guns, nothing about automatic rifles. We do have a theory about the Constitution that says we have to interpret it by what was meant at the time it was written. So 1787 for the basic constitution, 1791 for the first 10 amendments to the Bill of Rights, and other years for the other amendments as they were ratified. If we do that, then what is meant by arms in 1791 will be flintlock rifles, muskets, and maybe some cannons, but the bullet as we know it today, with a primer and gunpowder and a bullet within a cartridge, didn't exist until the next century. So they couldn't have meant that. So this is where originalists get into some trouble trying to apply the first, Second Amendment to today's world. Arms. Well, what are arms? I can call a, a pocket knife an arm, and then call an atomic bomb an arm. We have arms control talks between the nuclear powers at times, not discussing flintlock rifles, but discussing what to do about the nuclear weapons. So we have to interpret this in a way for it to make any sense that it would apply to the world of today. The first part, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. We have some people who will say, well, the reason for the Second Amendment is to give us the authority to keep and bear arms if we need to, to protect ourselves from an oppressive government. That's not what it says. It says the security of the state. The idea is the militia is there to protect the security of the free state, of the government, which in turn is there to protect the rest of us. So a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state at that time, as per the originalists, meant things like the Minutemen in Massachusetts and so on, people who had their own firearms and were ready to report to the town square upon call. But we don't really have that now. We have what's called the National Guard. And we have an Air National Guard. That is the outgrowth of what was originally the militia. A well-regulated militia does not mean a group of people who get together, get camouflage uniforms, get firearms, and go off and practice shooting and various maneuvers out in the woods and call themselves a militia. If I give you a cheese sandwich and call it a ham sandwich, which is still a cheese sandwich, it is a group of people out there practicing various maneuvers, having firearms that are not a well-regulated militia within the meaning of the Second Amendment. So they are not protected by the Second Amendment in that sense. But then we have a comma, which really gives us a second thought. A lot of political scientists say it could have been worded better. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So there. So we look at the First Amendment, which is just above. Congress shall make no law and goes on to say, abridging the freedom of speech. So well, what's the freedom of speech? Is it anything? Does it include making threats against people? Does it include slander or libel? No. Slander, by the way, being spoken mistruth that harms someone. Libel is a written mistruth that harms someone. Threats, slander, libel. Every once in a while, somebody does one of these things and goes to court and tries to defend himself by saying, I'm protected by the First Amendment. After the judge stops laughing, he says it's not covered under freedom of speech. First Amendment doesn't go into that level of detail, but even at the time it was adopted, for any originalists who are watching, the idea that threats, 
slander and libel were outside the protection of freedom of speech was well accepted by the people and by the law. So that defense doesn't work. Freedom of speech, therefore, has limitations. Does the right of the people to keep and bear arms have limitations? Now, the Second Amendment says, whatever that right is, it shall not be infringed. But what is that right? Does it apply to all people at all times, all places? So let's cover these things. All people. If all people have the right to keep and bear arms, then the people down at your state prison, who are people, have the right to carry guns around the prison yard. Keep guns in their cell for self-protection in case somebody gets rough with them, if a guard tries to get rough with them. Or just because they feel like having guns in their cell, because the Second Amendment doesn't say you have to give a reason. Now, if we exclude those people and say, well, they are not included, they're being punished, they don't have all the rights of free people, I will go along with you 100% and I will say, well, then it doesn't apply to all people. There are some people who don't have this right as well as some others. If all the people had the right to keep and bear arms, then you have a child 10 years old who wants to carry a gun to school. And if the parents say no, and the school board says no, and the superintendent of school says no, and the principal says no, they can still do it because they're protected by the Second Amendment. No. Those under 18 do not have the full rights of the Constitution. They're going to comply with the rules set by their parents, and they comply by the rules of the school district. What if you and I, if we're over 18, can we walk onto school property carrying a gun? And not if the school board says no. And schools generally have said this is a gun-free and drug-free zone, and they enforce it. So you would not be allowed to walk onto school premises, regardless of age, if you're carrying a gun. That's for the safety of the children and the staff and the faculty and the administration and visitors. That's not a good place for guns. So not all the people have the right to keep and bear arms and obviously not all places. Supposing we have a bar. Uh, we own the bar and we own the building. Now, in some cases, somebody owns the business but rents the building. But to simplify it, this person owns the bar and owns the property, owns the building and sets up a rule believing that alcohol and firearms don't mix very well, so no guns allowed. Can someone come along and say, I'm coming into your bar and I'm carrying a gun, so you have no right to keep me out. The Constitution says I have a right to keep and bear arms. That means any place I want so I can come onto your private property with a gun, even over your objections. No, the Constitution does not specifically address your right to keep people off your private property. But the 5th and 14th Amendments do state that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Among your property rights are the right to keep people out of your business and keep people off your property if you don't want them there. And we have trespass laws. Now, this seems to come into conflict with the Second Amendment, but they do mesh really pretty well. The right to keep and bear arms simply does not extend to private property. Now, when I said you have the right to keep people out, we do have certain civil rights laws that modify that, that you can't keep somebody out of your bar due to race and religion and ethnicity and so on. So we can say the Second Amendment does not protect somebody in carrying the firearm into the private property, because if they could, that could mean somebody could enter into your private property, your house, while you're sitting there with a gun, and you can't tell them to leave. You say, this is my private property, get out of here. They say, no, normally I'd be trespassing, but as long as I have a firearm with me, I have the right to keep and bear arms wherever I feel like it. No, your private property rights will come first. It's a trespass the moment you tell the person to leave and doesn't leave. So we've covered people and places. Times are important too. Times are important in that it applies even at a time when you're not home to guard your private property, a person notices a door open and happens to have a gun, cannot just go wandering in and explore and look at your private papers and be immune from prosecution because they happen to be carrying a gun. It's not breaking and entering, but is entering without your consent, and the law de deals with that. So we've covered people, places, times. Now what about arms? Well, we mentioned pocket knives, we mentioned nuclear weapons, and we have a number of things in between, handguns, rifles, shotguns, automatic rifles, hand grenades. What arms 
are covered under a right that shall not be infringed. If we go back to saying that arms control meetings discuss nuclear weapons, we could say a nuclear weapon is an arm. What's a nuclear weapon? We could have a nuclear bomb that you drop from an aircraft. You could have a nuclear warhead that you fire on a missile. And you could also have a nuclear device. A nuclear device could be a dirty bomb. That is a bomb that is built with nuclear materials, which could be waste materials from a nuclear power plant with explosives, that when it goes off, it spreads the material over a wide area and kills a lot of people by radiation. Not so much destroying people by an impact. But let's just say a dirty bomb. If the right to keep and bear arms includes all arms, then it includes the right of people to build a nuclear device in their backyard, and they aren't breaking any law until such time as they might set it off. Now we come along and we say, well, we do have some state laws about control of hazardous materials that say you cannot keep nuclear material on private property. But state law or regulation cannot overrule the Constitution. So if our argument is that a nuclear weapon is an arm and protected by the Second Amendment, if we can sell that, then the state laws and the state regulations won't apply. Of course, they do apply because nobody's going to be able to sell that. Why? Well, it's not a reasonable arm for you to have. That's really the explanation. Handguns have a practical purpose. Uh, shotguns and rifles for hunters. Bows and arrows. Some people go bow and arrow hunting. Once you get into an automatic rifle, is there a practical reason for somebody to own it? Is it an arm that was meant by the Second Amendment? Getting away from the originalist theory, the purpose of the Second Amendment, people have a right to keep and bear arms for their protection, getting away from hunting and target shooting and other things. I have a Glock 19 handgun, 9mm, and two magazines with 10 cartridges in each one. So I can fire 20 shots. If something happens at my house that I can't handle with 20 bullets, it's something I'm not going to be able to handle. So we can keep and bear arms. Once we point it at somebody, and of course, once we fire a bullet, we have responsibilities for the consequences there. But to keep and bear arms is the right. So if we get back to the nuclear weapon, if we have a nuclear weapon on our property, but we're not setting it off, if that was legal, then you could do it. I could do it, and everybody else in the country could do it. This includes people who intend terrorist activities. We have terrorists from foreign countries, and we have plenty of homegrown terrorists who might, on a particular occasion, want to set off some sort of a dirty bomb, which you could put into a tractor trailer, a small one in an SUV, park it somewhere, leave, and have it set up so that you can dial a phone number with a device attached to the nuclear device that will set it off when you're 100 miles away, 1,000 miles away, 10,000 miles away. And you're not committing any crime until you set it off, if that was covered under the Second Amendment. So the Second Amendment has to have some limitations to protect people from great danger. And so we see out of necessity, there are limitations on the Second Amendment. If you talk to the person who is most fervently against any form of gun control and you give them the argument that this means that the prisoners at the state prison, the convicted murderers, are allowed to carry guns, you are probably going to, well, not change their minds. It will probably make them pause and reflect. So the Second Amendment is not as absolute as some people believe it is. And most of those people seem to have never read the Second Amendment in the first place. So I hope this is informative for you. So if you like today's video, please subscribe and click the notifications button so that you don't miss the future videos we'll have coming. Also, please click the like button because that will help us get more viewers. Thank you for joining me today.